everyone, Mr. Nobody here. I am bringing you another uh, classical book reading as well as kind of another book review. This is one that is near and dear to my own heart. I grew up with this. Um, it, it means a lot to me. The Merry Adventures of Robin Hood by Howard Pyle. I grew up uh, reading this book and listening to this book. I had a reading of it on tape that I loved. Um, had the you know, it was frequently made into a picture book. Um, and Howard Powell did all his own illustrations, and they're really quite wonderful. Um, and so here's just an example of them. Uh, he was a great illustrator. He also wrote The Book of Pirates, which is a book he collected the story. So this is the great thing about Howard Pyle. Um, he went around and collected the stories and then put them all together into... He tried to make a kind of coherent whole out of them. So he collected the many and various stories of King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table and, you know, put them together into his version of telling of them. He took the various stories of Robin Hood, put them together, and collected them into a coherent story that actually, you know, starts uh, at the beginning of Robin Hood's career and uh, ultimately ends with his death. Um, and uh, you've also got the Book of Pirates, which of course is about a bunch of different pirates. Great illustrations in that, but it tells, you know, the classic tales of the time. Um, so a really, uh, a really um, fun and interesting author, talented illustrator. Um, you can get versions that have color versions of these stories, uh, uh, sorry, of these pictures. Um, he has such a neat uh, way of writing too. It's very much, um, it's like a storyteller, you know, reading aloud to you. You can tell it comes, you can tell these were, a lot of these were oral stories, and he's trying to take these oral stories and commit them to the page and put them in a way that they can be shared. Um, so all I'm going to read to you here is the preface, because I find it to be such an interesting um, preface. And also, with what wonderful illustrations, he illuminates it like it's a medieval manuscript, and I just love that about it. Um, and then I'm going to just read you the very, very beginning about uh, how Robin Hood got started. <clears throat> I will say I learned a lot from this book. I learned a lot about language. Uh, you can get modernized versions of this. Um, I personally am a fan of the original. Um, I love the old language. Um, I find it wonderful. It's beautiful. But you can get modernized adaptations that are both shorter and simpler, ones that are made for younger kids. Um, I learned so much about how to read literature just by reading this book as a child. And even when I didn't understand the words, um, you get the sense of it. And that's also if you can find uh, a recorded version of it, something read by a reader. It's great because they help you understand the meaning of the words just by reading it. Um, but it made me able to read British literature um, from a wide variety of periods because I was introduced to this book fairly young and understood what the words meant um, and this more anachronistic type of English. Anyway, I'll get started. <clears throat> Preface. From the author to the reader, you who so plod among serious things that you feel it shame to give yourself up, even for a few short moments, to mirth and joyousness in the land of fancy, you who think that life hath not to do with innocent laughter that can harm no one, these pages are not for you. Clap to the leaves and go no further than this, for I tell you plainly that if you go farther, you will be scandalized by seeing good sober folks of real history, so frisk and caper and gay colors and motley, that you would not know them but for the names tagged to them. Here is a stout, lusty fellow with a quick temper, yet known so well for all that, who goes by the name of Henry the Second. Here is a fair, gentle lady before whom all the others bow and call her... Queen Eleanor. Here is a fat rogue of a fellow dressed up in rich robes of a clerical kind that all the good folk called my Lord Bishop of Hereford. Here is a certain fellow with a sour temper and a grim look, the worshipful Sheriff of Nottingham. And here above all is a tall, merry fellow that roams the greenwood and joins in homely sports and sits beside the Sheriff at merry feast which same beareth the name of the proudest of the Plantagenets, Richard of the Lion's Heart. 
Beside these are a whole host of knights, priests, nobles, burglars, yeomen, pages, ladies, lasses, landlords, beggars, peddlers, and whatnot, all living the merriest of merry lives, and all bound by nothing but a few odd strands of certain old ballads, snipped and clipped and tied together again in a score of knots, which draw these jocund fellows here and there, singing as they go. Here you will find a hundred dull, sober, jogging places, all tricked out with flowers and what not, till no one would know them in their fanciful dress. And here is a country bearing a well-known name, wherein no chill mists pre press upon our spirits, and no rain falls but what rolls off our backs like April showers off the backs of sleek drakes where flowers bloom forever and birds are always singing, where every fellow hath a merry catch as he travels the roads, and ale and beer and wine, such as muddle no wits, flow like water in a brook. This country is not fairyland. What is it? Tis the land of fancy, and is of that pleasant kind that when you tire of it, whisk, you clap the leaves of this book together, and tis gone, and you are ready for everyday life, with no harm done. And now I lift the curtain that hangs between here and no man's land. Will you come with me, sweet reader? I thank you. Give me your hand. So, as I said, a wonderfully amusing um, introduction. So we're going to uh, skip forward to the prologue. <clears throat> there you are, some of the illustrations. Robin Hood goes to the shooting match. Giving an account of Robin Hood and his adventure with the king's foresters, also telling how his band gathered round him and the merry adventure that gained him his good right-hand man, the famous Little John. In merry England in the time of old, when good King Henry II ruled the land, there lived within the green glades of Sherwood Forest near Nottingham Town a famous outlaw whose name was Robin Hood. No archer ever lived that could speed a gray goose shaft with such skill and cunning as his, nor were there ever such yeomen as the seven-score merry man that roamed with him through the greenwood shades. Right merrily they dwelt within the depths of Sherwood Forest, suffering neither care nor want, but passing the time in merry games of archery or bouts of cudgel play, living upon the king's venison, washed down with draughts of ale in October brewing. Not only Robin himself, but all the band were outlaws, and dwelt apart from other men. Yet they were beloved by the country people round about, for no one ever came to Jolly Robin for help in time of need, and went, went, and went away again with an empty fist. And now I will tell how it first came about that Robin Hood fell afoul of the law. When Robin was a youth of eighteen, stout of sinew and bold of heart, the sheriff of Nottingham proclaimed a shooting match, and offered a prize of a butt of ale to whomever should shoot the best shaft in Nottinghamshire. Now, quoth Robin, will I too go, for fain when I draw a string for the bright eyes of my lass, and a butt of good October brewing. So up he got and took his stout yew bow and a score more of broad cloth yard arrows, and started off from Loxley Town through Sherwood Forest to Nottingham. It was at the dawn of day in the merry Maytime, when hedgerows were green and flowers bedecked the meadows, daisies pied and yellow cuckoo buds and fair primroses all along the briery hedges, when apple buds blossom and sweet birds sing, the lark at dawn of day, the throstle cock and cuckoo, when lads and lasses look upon each other with sweet thoughts, when busy housewives spread their linen to bleach upon the bright green grass. Sweet was the greenwood as he walked along its paths, and bright the green and rustling leaves, amid which the little bird sang with might and main, and blithely Robin whistled as he trudged along, thinking of Maid Marian and her bright eyes, for at such times a youth's thoughts are wont to turn pleasantly upon the lass that he loves best. As thus he walked along with a brisk step and a merry whistle, he came suddenly upon some foresters seated beneath a great oak tree, 
Fifteen there were in all, making themselves merry with feasting and drinking as they sat around a huge pasty, to which each man helped himself, thrusting his hands into the pie, and washing down that which they ate with great horns of ale, which they drew all foaming from a barrel that stood nigh. Each man was clad in Lincoln green, and a fine show they made, seated upon the sward beneath that fair spreading tree. Then one of them, with his mouth full, called out to Robin, Hello, where goest thou, little lad, with thy one penny bow and thy farthing shafts? Then Robin grew angry, for no stripling likes to be taunted for his green years. Now, quoth he, my bow and eke mine arrows are as good as thine. Moreover, I go to the shooting match in Nottingham Town, which same has been proclaimed by our good sheriff of Nottingham. There I will shoot with other stout yeomen, for a prize has been offered of a fine but of ale. Then one who held a horn of ale in his hand said, Ho, oh, listen to the lad. Why, boy, thy mother's milk is yet scarce dry upon thy lips, and yet thou prattest of standing up with good stout men at Nottingham butts, thou who art scarce able to draw one string of a two-stone bow. I'll beat, I'll hold the best of you twenty marks, quoth bold Robin, that I hit the clouded threescore rods by the help of our lady fair. At this all laughed aloud, and one said, Well boasted, thou fair infant, well boasted, and well knowest thou no target is nigh to make good thy wager. And another cried, He'll be taking ale with his milk next. At this Robin grew right mad. Hark ye, said he, yonder at the glade's end I see a herd of deer even more than three score rods distant. I'll hold you twenty marks that by leave of Our Lady I cause the best heart among them to die. Now done, cried he who had spoken first, and here are the twenty marks. I wager thou causest no beast to die, with or without the aid of Our Lady. Then Robin took his good yew bow in hand, and placing the tip at his instep, he strung it right deftly. Then he knocked a broad cloth-yard arrow, and raising the bow, drew the gray goose feather to his ear. The next moment the bowstring rang, and the arrow sped down the glade as a sparrow hop skims in the northern wind. High leaped the noblest heart of all the herd, only to fall dead, reddening the green path with his heart's blood. Ha! cried Robin. How likest thou that shot, good fellow? I want the wager were mine if it were three hundred pounds. Then all the foresters were filled with rage, and he who had spoken the first and had lost the wager was more angry than all. Nay, he cried, the wager is none of thine, and get thee gone straightway, or by all the saints of heaven I'll baste thy sides until thou wilt never be able to walk again. Knowest thou not, said another, that thou hast killed the king's deer, and by the law of our gracious lord and sovereign king Harry, thine ears can be shaven close to thy head. Catch him, cried the third. Nay, said a fourth, let him go in because of his tender years. Never a word, said Robin Hood. But he looked at the foresters with a grim face, and then turning on his heel, strode away from them down the forest glade. But his heart was bitterly angry, for his blood was hot and youthful and prone to boil. Now well would it have been for him who had first spoken had he left Robin Hood alone, but his anger was hot, both because the youth had gotten the better of him, and because of the deep draughts of ale that he had been quaffing. So of a sudden, without any warning, he sprang to his feet and seized upon his bow and fitted it to his shaft. Aye, cried he, and I'll hurry thee anon. And he sent an arrow whistling after Robin. It was well for Robin Hood that that same forester's head was spinning with ale, or else he would never have taken another step. As it was, the arrow whistled within three inches of his head. Then he turned around and quickly drew his own bow and sent an arrow back in return. Ye said I was no archer, cried he aloud, but say so now again. The shaft flew straight. The archer fell forward with a cry and lay with his face upon the ground, his arrows rattling about him from out of his quiver, the gray goose shaft wet with his heart's blood. Then before the others could gather their wits about him, Robin was gone into the depths of the greenwood. Some started after him, but not with much heart, for each feared to suffer the death of his fellow. So presently they all came and lifted the dead man up and bore him away to Nottingham Town. Meanwhile, Robin Hood ran through the greenwood, 
Gone was all the joy and brightness from everything, for his heart was sick within him, and it was borne in upon his soul that he had slain a man. Alas, cried he, thou hast found me an archer that will make thy wife to ring. I would that thou hadst never said one word to me, or that I had never passed thy way, or even that my right forefinger had been stricken off ere this had happened. In haste I smote, but grieve I sore at leisure. And then, even in his trouble, he remembered the old saw that what is done is done, and the egg cracked cannot be cured. And so he came to dwell in the green wood that was to be his home for many years to come, and never again to see the happy days with the lads and lasses of sweet Loxley town, for he was outlawed, not only because he had killed a man, but also because he had poached upon the king's deer, and two hundred pounds were set upon his head as a reward for whoever would bring him to the court of the king. Now the sheriff of Nottingham swore that he himself would bring this knave, Robin Hood, to justice, and for two reasons. First, because he wanted the two hundred pounds, and next, because the forester that Robin Hood had killed was of kin to him. But Robin Hood lay hidden in Sherwood Forest for one year, and in that time gathered many uh, others around him like himself, cast out from other folk for this cause and for that. Some had shot deer in hungry winter time when they could get no other food, and had been seen in the act by the foresters, but had escaped, thus saving their ears. Some had turned, been turned out of their inheritance, that their, their farms might be added to the king's lands in Sherwood Forest. Some had been despoiled by a great baron or a rich abbot or a powerful esquire, all for one cause or another had come to Shearwood to escape wrong and oppression. So in all that year, five score more good stout yeomen gathered about Robin Hood and chose him to be their leader in chief. Then they vowed that even as they themselves had been despoiled, they would despoil their oppressors, whether baron, abbot, knight, or squire, and that from each they would take that which had been wrung from the poor by unjust taxes or land rents or in wrongful fines, but to the poor folk they would give a helping hand in need and trouble, and would return to them that which had been unjustly taken from them. Besides this, they swore never to harm a child, nor to wrong a woman, be she maid, wife, or widow, so that after a while, when the people began to find that no harm was meant to him, but that money or food came in time of want to many a poor family, they came to praise Robin and his merry men, and to tell many tales of him and of his doings in Sherwood Forest, for they felt him to be one of themselves. And that's all I'm going to read for today. Uh, if you have a chance to pick this up and read it, it's a lot of fun. Robin's first encounter with little John is a lot of fun. Uh, they're quite characters. They're both obstinate. They're both proud. They both beat each other quite thoroughly and then find that they're actually uh, very similar and really love each other. Um, and you see the gathering of his, his other friends, often through misadventures. Um, he meets Will Scarlet, who I believe is a cousin of his, and the same thing happens. He's like, ah, oh, there's a Norman going around. And by the way, the conflict between the Normans and the Anglo-Saxons does come up in this. Robin thinks he's a Norman lord and says, I'm, I'm going to go give this guy the business. And he ends up getting absolutely whipped and hided by his cousin and begging for mercy. And then they all end as friends. There's a similar adventure with uh, with the Tinker. The, it's guys, they end up fighting and then they win respect from each other. They become friends and then they have adventures together. There's the shooting contest, all the sort of famous Robin Hood stories. And you do get the, the final, um, like if you're familiar with the Disney movie, um, the return of King Richard, Robin getting parted, becoming uh, the Earl of Loxley, um, and uh, going straight, him and his merry men. And so it, it has a happy ending. But uh, you also get the final story of the death of Robin Hood and keeps carrying history forward to the point where things change again. And uh, Richard Lionheart is gone and um, Robin has fallen out of favor with some people. Um, and the, the ending story is actually very sad. I, the ending story was actually the first one is one of my favorites and the last one is also one of my favorites. It's very moving uh, to hear it as a young kid and to like hear the story of how Robin Hood tragically dies 
Um, I always found it to be an extremely moving story. Um, and I think, uh, I think this is a wonderful book for children. Now I've read it aloud just so you can see, it is actually very readable. It's written in a way that as long as you're familiar with a few old words and once you've read it a few times, you're like, oh, I know it. Uh, especially with some of the old spellings, once you get used to it, um, it's actually very readable. Um, because cause it is meant for the enjoyment of the young. Um, but uh, I will just tell you, I, I'm not going to, to read from the last chapter. I mean, I'm not going to read it, but I'm going to read a little bit of it. And you can see the drawing he did for this. This is the Reaper. <laughs> so this is from the epilogue. So ye great Reaper reapeth among the flowers telling how Robin Hood came back to Sherwood Forest, and how Sir William Dale was sent against him to take him. Likewise, it is told how Robin Hood died by the treachery of his cousin, the prioress of the nunnery of Kirklees. So uh, a prioress means she was uh, in charge of a large religious property, a priory. Um, and at the time, uh, a lot of the intellectual knowledges and books were held by them. Um, a lot of the specialized um, trades uh, also came out of things like ab abbeys and priories, including what medicine they had. And that's actually how his um, cousin assassinates him. Um, but I'll just tell you the this entry, which I really enjoy. It says, and now, dear friend, you have journeyed with me in all these merry doings. I will not bid you to follow me further but will drop your hand here with a good din, if you wish it. For that which cometh hereafter speaks of the breaking up of things, and shows how joys and pleasures that are dead and gone can never be set upon their feet to walk again. I will not dwell upon the matter over long, but will tell as speedily as may be how that stout fellow, Robin Hood, died as he lived, not at court as Earl of Huntington, but with bow in hand, his heart in the greenwood, and he himself, a right yeoman, um, and that uh, that voice, that 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 um, storytelling voice of Howard Pyle is actually one of the truly delightful things um, about him, and it's similar in many ways to Rudyard Kipling. Rudyard Kipling um, also has that similar, like like someone telling a story to their best friend around a fire, or like someone tucking their child in at night, and of course with. Um, uh, with Rudyard Kipling and some of his books, that's exactly what they were. They were the stories that he told to his children, putting them to sleep at night. Um, sometime I'll find time to talk about the Just So stories. Uh, wonderful stories, wonderful book, one of my own children's favorites, but also with an, uh, an incredibly moving story behind where, where it came from. Um, the bedtime stories to his child, who uh, both of them caught pneumonia and she died, and he wanted to to capture the stories he would tell her every single night, just so. Um, anyway, that's not the story for today, The Merry Adventures of Robin Hood by Howard Pyle. Uh, if you can find it, get a hold of it. If you can find an adaptation, get hold of it. But the truth is, this is so elevated and wonderful in its language and its pictures that I would get the original. Same thing for the Book of Pirates. I used to just keep the Book of Pirates around uh, long before my kids could read it or understand it, just as a decoration, because it's a beautiful book. And of course, his uh, King Arthur, also excellent. So if you have a chance to check out any of Howard Pyle's books, they have influenced your life in some way. These are some of the most famous tellings of these classic stories that have become just a, a key part of our culture and uh, the, the stories that we still enjoy today. And uh, that's all for today, and I'll talk to you later.